All right, I just got done doing some rather monotonous work in the farm. So now let's have a little pick me up. Uh, let's do some mealworm Q and A. Uh, I got a follow up uh, email with questions from our, our friend Davin. So we're gonna run through that um, and uh, take a look at what we've got. Uh, question number one. Uh, the box that you mentioned to not add additional substrate media again after they're ready to ship, do you uh, ever clean the frass out or only once before shipping? Um, so, Davin, what I do with that is um, I'll monitor. There are scenarios where I, I will put uh, wheat bran into those trays um, with the mealworms that are going to ship out. And then just to let them eat that overnight. And then that does result in frass. Uh, and so what I'll do is... Um, I will always, before I package them up, I will always run them through the fine mesh sifter to get the frass out uh, and then uh, package them up. There is a, a likelihood that they will continue to uh, defecate in the bag since they've been eating. Uh, so there'll be a, a small bit of frass in the box, but not as much uh, as if I just dumped it all in there um, and, and didn't sift it out beforehand. So I do try to clean that out. And then I also do uh, take that, that process or, or that time as I'm sifting the frass out to uh, look for any dead mealworms that might be in there, any pupa that, that have snuck in um, and grab those out as well. So a bit of quality control. Uh, so it serves a, a double purpose there. Uh, question number two, how often do you clean their exoskeleton and with what tools do you clean them with? Um, so the exoskeleton is a, a layer on top, right? And as those mealworms grow, um, when they're small, you're not going to notice it very much at all. But as they continue to grow, um, usually about maybe a month to, so let's do weeks instead of like 1.25 months, my brain's uh, fuzzy today. So at about the four to five week mark, you're gonna to start to see accumulation of the exoskeleton on top. I personally don't do anything with that. I let it be um, and, and I don't mess with it. Um, I haven't found a need to remove it uh, because there's no, uh, from, a, from a, a rearing perspective, if the exoskeleton is on top there, um, it's very likely that it might hold some heat in, um, but I just haven't noticed any sort of issue or problem with just leaving it there and letting it be and then dealing with it whenever we harvest. Uh, when we harvest, what we'll see is as we're you know, combining bins and sifting and doing all of our stuff, uh, that, that exoskeleton will start to build up. And so what we'll do is we'll take a vacuum, uh, we'll take the hose, turn that vacuum on and hold it about an inch to two inches, mm -hmm, inch to two inches uh, above the exoskeleton. And the exoskeleton is so light that that vacuum will pull it up and it's not going to pull the mealworms, even the dead ones that are in there. I've, I've thought, hey, maybe I can get the dead ones out too this way. Uh, unfortunately, there's not enough suction there to get the dead ones, but the exoskeletons come right up. Um, so you could do that same process uh, with a vacuum um, of, of like going over the top of your bins if you want to remove that exoskeleton. The other thing you can do is the exoskeleton is very light. Um, it, it's, it's airy. And so what I've seen other folks do is they'll take it outside because uh, remember exoskeleton is part of the insect. Uh, it, it's their shedding whenever they molt. And so there are some people that are allergic to that or could become allergic to it with exposure over time. Uh, so definitely do this where the wind's going to blow it away from you uh, or, or and or wear a mask of some kind uh, when you try this. But if you take that bin and you just very lightly blow over the top of it with your mouth, um, that will push that exoskeleton out. Uh, if it's windy, the wind is just going to whip it out as well. Uh, so be mindful of that. I've actually had that happen when I was transporting mealworms from one, one location to another. I just walked outside with a tray in my hands and the wind blew it right up in my face. So um, I won't forget that. Uh, won't do that again. Um, but that's a, a pretty easy way uh, to remove those exos exoskeletons. Again, I, I don't do that unless there's a need to. Uh, or if you're finding that there's a problem of some kind. So, uh, question number three, do you immediately start spraying water uh, on the baby mealworm after day one, after you separate the beetles, or do you wait a few days? Uh, awesome question. So right now I am waiting uh, one week. So uh, today is actually beetle, uh, beetle tray swap day. And so what we'll do is we will swap all of the bins and basically build a new stack or new row. Um, and then that, row will not get hydration until the following week. Um, my reasoning for that is I don't want to spray the bran when those mealworms don't have a chance, like they're still hatching, they're still growing um, 
you know, there's a high likelihood that there are some already hatched, uh, but I just don't want to chance it. Um, it's one of those things that in the future I'll probably tweak it. Uh, once we have everything squared away from a, a base process level, uh, then I'll start doing some more analysis uh, around what would be optimal um, from a, a spraying perspective. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're waiting a week, giving those mealworms uh, in those trays another week to, to hatch out, and then they get into the rotation for spraying. Um, and then I, I'll spray them until um, usually about the four to five week mark. When you start to see those exoskeletons, that's when I'll switch them over to the water gel crystal. Um, so that way they, I don't put any uh, like potatoes, carrots, uh, water gel crystals, I don't put any of that stuff in the baby bins until they're older because they just won't consume it fast enough. It'll dry out and then later when you go to sift it, you've got all that stuff and gunk and whatnot in there. So, uh, all right, number four, total of six questions. Um, number four, you mentioned in your last video that you uh, see the, to separate the sizes of your mailers before sending them to your customers. Can you show me what sizes uh, that you use? Link to the item that you use would be greatly appreciated. Uh, yes, so I don't have them in here with me, um, but what they are, um, I'll, I'll post the sizes that I use uh, in the description here along with a link so you can get an idea of, of where it's at um, or, or what it physically looks like uh, from a product perspective. Um, but what we're using now is the 1 8 inch uh, mesh that separates out the beetles, the larger larva, and the pupa uh, from everything else. And so that's a good way to get just mealworms uh, through to the next step. Um, the other mesh sizes that we'll use um, when we're sifting frass, we're using the 1 30th mesh. Um, we use both the, excuse me, we use both the green sifter, uh, bucket sifter right now, uh, but I am experimenting with a sheet, basically, a roll uh, that, I, that I flattened out. Um, I believe it's like 18, 16 or 18 inches by four feet um, to sift out the frass, but it's 1 30th mesh. Uh, I've tried 1 50th and it, it just takes too long um, from a, a process and time perspective. Um, it wasn't worth doing that. Uh, the, and, and what that did result in is there was some substrate. Uh, so we try to let them eat uh, as long as possible to get just frass in there. But at some point, it get the, the, those trays will get to a point where you need to harvest it even if there's some, some substrate in there. Um, and so the 1 30th does a really good job of separating out uh, the, the substrate that's in there. Um, the 1 50th will catch a little bit of it. So I did notice just a tiny bit of it was caught uh, when it was in there by the 1 50th, but it took forever for the frass to get through. Um, it was just not conducive. Uh, I would have to like triple the cost of the frass prices when I sell it because of the time it would take to do that. Uh, if I can scale up, uh, which I'm hoping to do with that new machine uh, that I'm building, and then the goal there would be to to see like does would 150th work um, to get a finer product potentially so we'll see uh, but yes i will link that in the description um, down below number five uh, with what you're doing now with such efficiency experience in your work systems i'm wondering how many kilograms of beetles and their offspring do you think one person can handle in your opinion uh thank you that's a very nice compliment um i i need to get better at acknowledging that I'm doing better and doing well. Uh, but I still th see things as a, ooh, I can improve that. Ooh, I can do this better. So I still feel like I'm on that path. Uh, but thank you for that. Um, how many kilograms of beetles and their offspring do you think one person can handle? Um, so I honestly think, I do a lot of ancillary things. So like this this here, uh, making Q&A videos, doing consulting, um, doing the lives in various, you know, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera. Um, I'm doing a lot of just messing around with different experiments, different projects that are soaking up my time. Um, but I would say if none of that was in play and all you were doing is taking care of the insects and doing the processes required to raise them, harvest them, take care of them, um, I think one person could handle uh, this 1,000 square foot um, uh, rearing room that we have now. Um, when that scales, so my intention over the next six to 12 months is to double um, or 2.5x 2, 2 production here. Uh, I know I can double it. Uh, we can fit the, that amount of trays in. I'm curious to see what happens uh, once we do that, if we have enough physical space for us to still work in there, or if we get moved, we'll see. But um, it could easily be doubled. But at that point, 
we get into process and efficiency from a labor perspective. So the sifting that we're doing now is very manual. Um, and so that's where the, the sifting machine uh, will come in to help with that. Um, and then there's some other things that need to be optimized, like getting frat or I'm sorry, getting substrate into the bins whenever they need to be uh, prepared for fresh beetles. Uh, beetle swap needs to be improved. There's something coming for that. Um, I'm really excited about that. Uh, we'll talk about that when it happens. Um, and so I, I think one person, one person can definitely do uh, the 1,100 trays that I have in rotation right now, and that's cranking out about a million mealworms a month right now. Um, so we're we're like right there. Once we hit a million, I'm gonna go berserk because that's that's gonna be fantastic. So um, I do think one person can handle it, and that's. From a, a U.S. perspective, I'm looking at it in the traditional traditional 40-hour work week. Um, from a running a business perspective, I'm over here checking on things on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, like Sunday, I come over and do the prep for the mealworms to eat overnight, so they're good to go to ship out the next day. Um, but I would say that averaging you know 40 hours a week um, over you know all seven days uh, is really the amount of time being spent on strictly rearing and shipping and providing mealworms to customers. Uh, number six, last one. Uh, you mentioned that you were doing eight batches from the start of the beetle lifespan. After how many days do you usually sell the mealworm that is ready to harvest? Uh, right now we are uh, in a scenario where after we have swapped the beetles, um, it is taking approximately eight to 10 weeks, usually more towards the 10 week side. Um, and what we're doing right now is that that is sort of a fuzzy area um, because once we have swapped them, they, they, they get, get in rotation. Um, so on the north side of our, our building, our, our, uh, bleh, sorry, on the north side of the insect room is where the oldest worms are. And then as you move south, uh, it gets they get younger and younger. Um, no other like no reason from a you know north south east west perspective other than the configuration of the room and how we've set it up um, there's no you know like magnetic pole thing going on there uh, no secrets um, so uh, it's taking us about eight to ten weeks from the the swap to when they're ready to harvest and I, I mentioned that that's fuzzy because one of the things that we're seeing is there are some trays that are that are um, getting faster or, or getting to that point faster and other trays that aren't. And I think that's just a discrepancy in the age of our beetles. Um, so right now we're swapping beetles every week. Uh, ideally, we would shrink that down to maybe twice a week, depending on the age, and then go to once a week once they're older. So that way the number of eggs in there, uh, in that tray, are more equalized. Because if a fresh beetle bin they're, they they lay their eggs um, all in that in the first two months of their life, right? Ninety five percent plus of their eggs is laid in the first two months of their life, but a bulk of them are laid in the first few weeks, and then it starts to go down, uh, and then it just plummets after the the eight weeks. And so if you swap those trays sooner, no, if you swap those trays more frequently sooner in that tray, uh, you're gonna get get an equal amount of eggs to when at some point you'll have to switch and do it once a week and get the same amount of eggs because it's gonna take them longer to, to lay that same quantity. And so I think what we're seeing is just a, a you know, a, a separation in um, the number of mealworms because of the trays being older in some cases than other trays. Uh, so again, that's another one of those things to like optimize and fine tune once we have the base in and once we've gone through an entire year of weather here. Uh, we're just switching over to cold weather. I got to get a heater installed today because the temperature is dropping too low in the farm. Um, so th there's a whole thing going on there. But um, yeah, it's, I would say it's about eight to 10 weeks right now. There are folks that have it lower than that. So you can optimize that in many different ways. Uh, temperature and humidity are huge factors, absolutely huge. Um, outside of that, uh, nutrition. So if you were to give them something with more nutrition, uh, protein, for example, uh, then that should... Theoretically, that should reduce that time span. What you need to take into account, though, is that at least here in the U.S., those higher protein items are more expensive. And so you might be saving a bit from a time perspective. Um, and somebody needs to do some math. Maybe I'll do that in the future once I've got more data here. Uh, but there's going to be a point where it makes more sense to pay uh, for protein, for higher protein feed, and reduce that time so that you're not spending the electricity and the time uh, to get, and, the, and the moisture 
to get them to the, the final harvest um, harvest point. So I haven't done that math yet. Uh, I'm trying to keep things consistent for a, a while here just to be able to get things where they need to be, get ba baselines, uh, and then start tinkering with, okay, if I give 10% of my trays in this one batch uh, more protein, whether that's unmedicated chick feed, whether it's uh, some sort of you know meat potentially, uh, something with more protein in it than just wheat bran, and then monitor that tray and see, okay, maybe it's done two weeks early. What was the cost difference in what I had to pay for that unmedicated chick feed versus the two weeks of the, that individual tray's percentage of electric, labor, and moisture? So uh, lots more to, to analyze there in the future as we get things rolling. Um, but uh, hopefully things are going well for you. I love these questions. If anybody else has any questions out there and would like some sort of video response like this, um, shoot me an email, justin at midwestmealworms.com. I'll put that in the description as well. Um, I don't put any personal information out there, uh, so it's gonna be just like this. Um, and hopefully we can spread some more information about mealworms and help each other out. So Davin, thank you very much. I hope things are going well for you and talk to y'all later.